Hello and welcome to the Voice of the Patient podcast. We are the podcast working to change lives, that is, improve the quality of life through not only hearing, but truly listening to the voice of the patient. Hi again, everybody, and welcome to the Voice of the Patient podcast. In case you're wondering, you haven't downloaded the wrong episode. I am David Reed, and this is a special episode and a special mini-series of The Voice of the Patient. Zach Cerns is here with me, so don't panic. <laughs> I'll be his trusty sidekick through the series. But first, a few introductions and some ground rules. Uh, about a week ago, we were approached by Sean Hagee. You may know him from Get PT First, or if you're in the Kansas City area, um, he may have visited your home. He's a home health PTA in the Kansas City, Missouri area. Sean has an interesting background, but something that he's been writing quite a bit about lately um, and has been a strong advocate for has been mental health. Uh, in fact, he's, he's recently started a campaign called uh, Hope for Mental Health at Hope for MH on Twitter. Wanted to get into a couple of rules and a couple of, and a little bit of background for uh, the, this episode and this series that we're going to do. First, this is going to be a no holds barred conversation. Uh, Sean approached the voice of the patient with the idea for this series and has asked that we help to to get rid of mental health stigma. As as the voice of the patient, it's an exciting opportunity. We believe that the stigma cannot be erased, though, without gaining a level of comfort worth our own personal discomfort. Sean wants to tell his story and for us to ask all the questions necessary to bring understanding of the mental health patient. We will be gentle and considerate. We'll be thorough in, in exploring this topic. We're going to cover some uncomfortable, scary, and potentially dark material. If you have kids listening, the material we're going to discuss probably isn't appropriate for them. Please listen to this series without your kids, or for that matter, anyone else's kids present. As healthcare providers, it's vital that we have a level of understanding of just how deep mental, mental illness can run, and that is not only okay, but absolutely necessary that we talk about it with, with our patients. We talk about exercise habits, weight management, diet, uh, and we're even getting more comfortable talking about sexual activity with our clients in the clinic. It's time we start to talk about mental health, too, just as freely, just as openly, and with just as much concern. Finally, neither Zach nor I are, are practicing providers of mental health uh, or mental health care or any type of mental health therapy. Uh, we and Sean are clear that nothing we discuss in this episode or those to come should be considered in any way as medical advice. The three of us strongly encourage anyone listening to contact your medical doctor for a referral to a mental health provider if you're struggling with mental health concerns. If you're listening to this and you're considering ending your life, please don't. You can call 911 or the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-TALK. That's 1-800-273-8255. The National Suicide Prevention Lifeline provides free and confidential emotional support to people in suicidal crisis or emotional distress 24 hours a day, seven days a week, anywhere across the United States. They're a national network of over 160 crisis centers combining custom local care and resources within national standards and, and best practices. Uh, so right now, I'll turn it over to Zach to get us kicked off as the host of The Voice of the Patient. Thank you, Dave. And thank you, Sean Hagee, for coming on to The Voice of the Patient. Uh, we're really excited for this mini-series, and we're really thrilled to have the opportunity to talk about these issues. So without any further ado, Sean, could you please tell us your story as a patient? Ooh, that's, uh, that opens things up. First off, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, secondly, uh, I have that um, National Suicide Prevention Lifeline uh, dialed into my phone, not only for myself, as we'll get into, but it's good to have it as a as a provider. So I recommend if you're a healthcare provider listening to this that you get that dialed into your phone because you never know. You just never know. That's what the story is all about, isn't it? You know, I, I guess the story goes back a really long ways. There's um, a family history, mental illness, in my extended family, goes back to a grandmother of mine who was hospitalized for depression before I was born. Uh, if you think some of the healthcare methods nowadays are barbaric, I'm sure you should see the way they used to treat mental health issues back in the day. Um, I'm, I'm fortunate to be alive today. 
for one thing. Um, so there's there's genetic factors. My my mother as well. One of my grandpas after he came back from the war um, came back a different man. Uh, a lot of those a lot of those guys that came back from World War II didn't talk about it. He was one of those. So none of us will ever know what he faced and what he went through. But looking back, you can with hindsight, you can see certain markers. And that's that's the story with me as well. I knew I knew something was wrong really early on in life. As a little kid, I was very anxious. I grew up in a home where there wasn't a lot of stability. Um, my mom and dad separated and then got divorced when I was younger. And about that about that same time frame, looking back, you can see where my personality started to change. I, I went from being a really shy, incredibly shy, anxious kid who never talked in class to being like the loud, obnoxious person that I am today. Um, that's a, a joker and um, kind of the class clown type of person. My wife stumbled across something not too long ago going through some of our old boxes. And one of the things she found was something written by me when I was maybe second grade. I wrote something down to the effect of, I wish I were dead. So I can't place ex exactly when things started to be kind of go go wrong but i i knew i knew from an early age that there was some serious things going on as i grew up um from say fifth grade on the, the typical kid things but my parents were divorced by that time i was the first kid in my class that had divorced parents believe it or not that's you know by the time i graduated everybody's was but uh, i was the first kid in my in my class that had divorced parents um, and already being predisposed for for depression in the family, you look back and you see the perfect storm brewing, not only genetically, but environmentally as well. To the point where when I became a teenager, I really started to go down downward, uh, becoming a little bit more introverted. Uh, the dark thoughts started happening. I'd, I'd gotten to the point where um, I was incredibly depressed and I had come very close to um, killing myself. That's a really long story for how I got to that point, but it was several years leading up. And to this day, I honestly don't know exactly why I didn't pull that trigger that night. I loaded the gun. I put it up to my head, put my finger on the trigger, and I walked away. Not because I was better. I, I honestly don't know. But as a 16-year-old with a really rough home situation with a super authoritarian, heavy-handed stepdad, a dad who was a wall, I didn't really talk to at all, and um, a mom who was concerned but not able to reach me. It's it's a tough situation, and and uh, you know a lot of teenager teenagers are caught in that situation, and a lot of them end their life. And a lot of people say, "I never saw it coming." Like he never gave any warning signs, and I probably was that kid. I was like the the fun, extra, appearing, extroverted type of kid playing sports, doing fun stuff, and I had just demons swirling in my head uh, all the time. Suicidal thoughts, at least as far back as when I was 14, at least, um, that have continued pretty much, pretty much to this day um, as a daily occurrence, if not several times a day, more in the, the passive realm, in the, in the mental health side of things, we talk about passive and active thoughts. So it's, it's been much more passive thoughts for, for those people that are familiar with that. Um, Sean, I'm I sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. Uh, can you clarify just 
you know, Zach, you have a little bit of a background in some of the, uh, you know, some of the mental health stuff, just for, for those of us who don't, uh, passive versus active voice. We have thoughts that come and that come and go, but an active thought being something that you end up, you end up planning, you end up exploring, you end up sort of guiding the thought process, but more of a, of a passive, uh, a passive thought being something that might just pop into your head, which happens to all of us about a variety of things. But Sean, could you, could you talk a little bit more? Is that what you were referring to or is there a sort of different yeah. ex- explanation that you'd offer? No, absolutely. That's pretty much it. Um, I've, I've always had those passive thoughts, kind of intrusive, kind of how when you're trying to focus on, on something, say some homework or you guys are studying for this podcast, writing things down, your mind wanders and trails off inadvertently. And uh, you're thinking about Doritos. And <laughs> that never Mount happened. Dew, that never Mount happened. Dew and, and whiskey. Um, and you're like, oh, I got to focus back. Um you, you know, the the funny thing is, is I have those thoughts, but they're like, your life is worthless. No one would miss you. Your life, your, the people in your life would be better off without you. And I know that sounds completely effed up to the nth degree, but it's true that I have those. Um, and And at times in my life, they've certainly been active to the point of, I've I have more suicide plans than I could care to admit. I've unfortunately been down that road and planned out my death <laughs> uh, at least hundreds of times. Um, thankfully, thankfully that's that's not the case um, at this very moment. But uh, I'd be lying to say uh, that I haven't had that even this year. So it's just, it's just what I, I face. Uh, And part of the stigma is, um, and the story goes, I really probably would have pulled the trigger, but unfortunately uh, my mom came across a suicide note, a rough draft. I hadn't completed it fully yet. So they've forced me into Um, counseling and locked up all the guns which i was really disappointed about because i probably would have come to that point Uh, which which brings me to my my first encounter with the healthcare system mental health care system so this puts us you know in the mid to late 90s i'm in high school probably a sophomore some somewhere around that age um and I and I sit down with the counselor. I'm I'm pretty pretty sure that she's been notified that they found a suicide note. Um, but one of the first things that she told me was, if I talked about suicide, that I had plans and those that I had suicidal thoughts, that basically I would be committed to inpatient care. And as a 15 year old in high school. I wasn't really interested in being committed to inpatient care. So I refused to talk about it. And that set the stage for, you know, the next 15 years of my life before I really sought out help is that encounter in the healthcare, the medical uh, mental health care community, where I was afraid to speak what was going on because of not just the stigma of being outed um, in a small community, but you know, just not having to go down that road. I didn't feel like I had any other valid options. So. Could you talk a little bit about how uh, how things have been since childhood? So, um, could you talk about either the recurrence of episodes or um, what you what you ended up doing about it as far as treatment or uh, how that developed over the course of your adulthood? 
Yeah, yeah. Um, looking back, the the label is called persistent depressive disorder, where it's not the e- extreme low of a major depressive episode, though I've unfortunately experienced those. Um, I didn't really have a true major depressive episode until I was an adult. But um, what it looked like and what it felt like as as a kid and as a teenager was overwhelming sadness, um, crippling even. Kind of like if you've ever had a, a, a loved one die suddenly. That overwhelming grief that hits you in the gut. But there's really nothing that you can literally nothing that you can put your finger on and say, this is why I'm grieving. This is why I'm sad. I'm incredibly overcome. And and as a kid, and it, hell, even now, as a having worked in healthcare and having gone to counseling and being equipped with all these words and <laughs> things, I still can't describe it well. How do you how do you describe something that's so deep seated emotionally? Um, that really can only be felt or experienced. Uh, so it is it is a bit like grief. But the thing the thing with depression is there's a lot of physical carryover as well. You know how you can you can be like so sad, you're sick, um, like heartbreak. Um, you can be so depressed that like I'm fatigued. I can't even get out of bed. I can't. F- I can't focus. My brain is cloudy. Um, I'm easily distracted, irritable. Uh, it's kind of like there's a filter on between you and the world, and you you can't really engage it like you normally would. Um, so it, it's not just a cognitive aspect, but also that physical aspect as well. As well, I mean, in high school. Uh, the humor class clown part was my defense mechanism. If I could, I learned if I could make people laugh, I could get the attention off of me and I could, it was a great distraction for me. So I wouldn't have to look in the mirror at someone I, I hated. So, you know, like, you know, and, and as an adolescent, it starts to maybe bring out some destructive behaviors as well. I was uh, quite the daredevil. And I I think (laughs) largely because I just didn't care. I I honestly didn't. I saw I did things that were really reckless, really, really reckless. And, um, you know, I guess I guess I made it through it. But, you know, there, there are certain signs that you can see even in uh, children and in adolescence, because you, I I didn't have words for it. I honestly didn't. I knew something was wrong. I I guessed that people didn't feel like this, but I I certainly didn't know for sure. And the and the greatest lie of depression and mental illness is the feeling that no one would understand that you're all alone, that you have to figure it out on your own. And I felt that way. And and that encounter with uh, that counselor um, sealed it for me. So, Sean, you talked about um, kind of being the class clown and, and um, you know, something that's run through my head. And I, I wanted to ask you about it later, but since you brought it up, you know, just kind of kind of thinking back about, you know, a lot of the a lot of the celebrities, especially comedians, uh, you know, when I was growing up, you know, died of either suicide or drug overdoses. And it seems that so often, you know, we, we find out later that that person was just immeasurably depressed. Um, why, why do, why do depression, in, I guess in, in your estimation or your studies or your, your, your background or Zach, I guess, I guess you too, but why, why do those two things, why, why do depression and, and creativity, outgoingness, extroversion so often, you know, why do they so often go hand in hand? That's a really good question. Um, there are so there are a couple things to even mention there. That uh, first to say with creativity, it's important to parse out a couple differences in mood disorders, and then it, it 
then this becomes really challenging because in the same way, Sean, that you mentioned, it's hard to put into words exactly what you're feeling. You know, there's so many professions and sciences that are trying to put into really abstract words of what's exactly going on. And so when there is, and as you said, there might be a major depressive episode or there might be a persistent depressive disorder that these are, these are different. And then on top of that, uh, there are many, many examples in the arts or just in society of people who are, who've been very successful, very creative, who probably have essentially hypomanic episodes along with their depressive episodes. So they might have these periods of time where they're supremely creative and supremely productive, but they don't have a full-blown manic episode in which they do some of the uh, really outlandish things such as you buy 50 cars. You know, they might not go to the point of risk-taking behavior that ruins their life, but they have just enough mania to be incredibly productive. And then once that hypomanic state subsides, then they do end up in a depressive episode. And I think we see that in a lot. And there are a lot of celebrities who have been very open about that. Uh, ben Stiller, for example, is one who's mentioned his, his history with that. On top of that, though, it's important to point out something about depression that really can create a lot of stress in life. And I don't want to get too far into the deep cuts of, of psychological science, but there is one really fascinating aspect of depression that's been studied, and it's called stress generation theory. All right, stress generation theory is this idea that those who are depressed can end up making their life more stressful from some of the decisions that happen. And so I, I relate with this, I've seen this, and I've, I've felt this with myself. And, and Sean, I think about your story of think about how things could have gone, like when you were in that, as you said, reckless stage like what if things were what if it had what if it had gotten a little bit unfortunate and what if things had gotten into some trouble and that would have been a good example of how a state of of some depression can end up making life harder and so that can be something that we see in our in our celebrities and and for example with drug overdoses and, and other things like that so it really, it really makes for an interesting view of depression as and something to think about for those who are depressed that if it seems that there may be some tough decisions involved, that that is part of part of depression. Yeah, I, um, you know, I've had the longstanding belief. Um, maybe it's just something to make myself feel better, but that uh, that us uh, depressives and um, folks with mental illness are are more creative. Um, I don't. Again, I don't know. Uh, one of the one of the strangest things, you know, personal anecdote. It's not worth anything for science, but when I am close to my worst uh, depressive state, I get really weird bursts of creativity. Stuff like get PT first. Uh, looking at the world differently, if nothing else, it gives us, a, us in the mental health side of things, a, a different look on the world that you normal people don't don't really get. It's weird. It's weird that way, um, that depressive realism per perspective or, or those kinds of things. What, Careful who you, you call it normal. <laughs> just, just be careful who you call them normal. I, I'm not sure that anyone has ever called me normal. <laughs> That's a spectrum. Yeah, it's it's one of those things. You look back at the Van Goghs, who was pretty clearly bipolar, or at least had major depressive episodes. Um, several famous artists, several comedians have come out. You know, Jim Carrey, Robin Williams. Um, it appears in Jim Carrey and Robin Williams' story to be very similar to mine, that they, they found comedy to be uh, a way to get them out. So whether it's whether it's the creative part or those kinds of things, I think that you'll I think you'll find that um, there is a lot of creativity amongst us depressives and, and those in the mental health community, uh, whether that's necessarily directly related to the mental illness itself. I think in my case, it is. I, I see it a lot. I went like I said, when I'm when I when I'm going down the road, I, I 
I have a lot of insight and, and weird things um, that kind of bubble up at the same time. It's, it's very strange. So I'd like to talk a little bit about what you had mentioned about the filter. Um, the, and this is, this is another really interesting area because a lot of those with who are experiencing uh, depression or depressive symptoms, there is an aspect of their filter being off. And so interpreting things in, in a different way, you know, for example, if someone, you just meet someone and they don't say goodbye to you, someone, if you're not experiencing depression, you might not think much of it, but someone in depression who is experiencing depression might think, wow, they, they didn't like me at all. And they did they have no interest in being my friend or something like that. For example, could you, yeah, cog- cognitive distortions, right? I, uh, I pace, I basically have my uh, doctorate degree in cognitive distortions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those are simply, uh, and people can look those up. Um, everyone has them to a certain degree. I, I just have them full blown because I'm, I've kind of built on this. Um, the overall generalizations, jumping to conclusions. Uh, some of that is is true for for those with anxiety, uh, especially, but. Um, for depression, it's also big. It's it's true as well. It can cloud your judgment. It can make you overemphasize small things and totally miss big things. You know, it's truly a disease of the mind. So it does. It can it can cloud your judgment, and it can um, have all those other factors on on as well. Sorry to jump in on you there. No, that's what I, that's what I wanted you to. Yeah, absolutely. And as you also mentioned, really important part of depression being also a very physical, physical disorder too. And that's something that can get overlooked. Some conceptions about depression might be that it's all mental, all in your head, but the mind and body dichotomy is, is really false. It's so, so related together. Could you talk a little bit more about how it affected you physically? Yeah, absolutely. Um, The physical aspects for me were really subtle in the, in the grand scheme, especially more on the persistent depression side of things. Um, Stuff that you might be able to diagnose as fibromyalgia like um, just achy stiffness, soreness, um, you know, maybe, maybe bits of chronic fatigue type of symptoms as well. Um, Lots of headaches, lots of headaches um, and, and weird pain stuff that, you know, now as a therapist looking back, just, you know, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't fit into patterns, uh, which was also a side note has made me scratch my head a lot looking back at some of those patients I had that never got better. And I I can't help but wonder, I can't help but wonder what was going on. But anyway, uh, yeah, on my end of things that can, um, when the depression's worsening, um, like for example, this last summer in uh, July, especially is when I hit the bottom this last July, nine, 10 months ago, the every physical symptom that you can imagine from nausea, um, lack of appetite, horrible sleep patterns to lots of, lots of pain, especially low back pain and neck pain when I'm really depressed. Um, those are, those are the main things, but you can, you know, it can affect sexual dysfunction as well. Like having from having no interest in sex whatsoever to not being able to orgasm, you know, it, it can go along that, that whole range. G, uh, GI symptoms are, are quite common in depressives as well. Um, and certainly personally for me. Thank you for listening to this episode of the voice of patient podcast to hear the rest of our conversation with Sean Hagee about his experience and some of his successes. Please tune in next week for the second part of this mini-series on mental health. In the meantime, find us all on Twitter. You can find Sean Hagee at Sean Hagee on Twitter. 
You can find Dave at DReadPT, and you can find me at Zach R. Stearns. Also check out Sean Hagee's new campaign, Mental Health Matters, and that is at Hope for MH on Twitter. Thank you for listening, and keep listening to the voice of the patient. If you enjoyed this episode, go to thevoiceofthepatient.org where you can find other helpful podcasts and blog posts that will show you how to improve healthcare through not only hearing, but truly listening to the voice of the patient. Thanks for listening. This podcast is brought to you in partnership with the Senior Rehab Project at seniorrehabproject.com. Thank you.